Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Welcome and sweet to be together and worship our God. Uh, if you're visiting, glad you're with us. This is a special Sunday. We're going to partake of the Lord's table together. There's really nothing sweeter in the body of Christ. This, this time to hold these elements in our hand and what they represent and to be filled with faith, to, to believe, and then to ask yourself, am I living in accord with these elements? Am I living in harmony with the Lord and with his people? And it's just this sweet time of refreshing and renewal as we remember our blessed hope. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, if your love for Christ is cooling, uh, this is the time to throw some coal uh, some em- on those embers of your love for him to look again and stare at the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a Puritan who said, I would hate my own soul if I found it not loving Christ. And that old hymn, more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee, that's my prayer for all of us this morning, that as we stare at this gospel and we come to the table is that uh, love to Christ would, would flourish in our hearts. So let's go to our God and, and ask for that. Father, I thank you. You've given us your Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And his role is to be a floodlight, to shine the light on Jesus Christ and all his glory and beauty. And so we pray that you would do that work this morning through the word. Oh, Holy Spirit, just just shine. Shine on Christ. Let us see him in all his fullness and all his beauty by faith. Let us behold this glorious one and be metamorphosed into his image. And so, God, would you meet us here now? We have been in this book for two years, and we ask now as we close up this section that you would come move in power in every heart. And so I, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week we, we finished an amazing chapter, I, Romans chapter 8. It's hard to come to an end. Uh, we set out two years ago to study the book of Romans, and our goal, we said we're not just going to mark up the book of Romans, but we wanted to mark us up and transform and change us by the power of the gospel. January of 2020, three months before COVID hit, we began praying for the revival of 2020. That was the top of my notes every Sunday, revival of 2020. And now it says 2022. I just keep praying for it. I had no idea, though, what was coming upon the church as we navigated it and all the surrounding issues, both politically and economically and socially and internally and externally. I just knew I was asking God to revive us and that it would spread to the nations, to where God and his gospel is what filled our hearts and our ambitions and our goals, that it would be our chief end truly, and not just a doctrinal statement or a confession, not just something we nod our heads to, but that we are taken up with this gospel. And I just know how much Jesus hates lukewarmness. I want to spit it out of my mouth I wish that you were hot or cold in Revelation 3. I know that meandering and apathy, just kind of coasting, drowsiness, selling your birthright for a bowl of stew, are not worthy responses to such a gospel. Grumbling and whining and complaining as you gaze at the glories of Romans 1 through 8 is tepid. It's lukewarm. And so we set out praying and asking God to meet us in Romans in that way, and then COVID hit. I was preaching Romans 1 through 3. This is a, the section of condemnation. <laughs> Sometimes just standing alone in this building with the live stream. You're hunkered down at home in very uncertain times, learning about condemnation. What a pastor. We, he loves us. Let's go through the hardest time of our lives and have him preach condemnation and our guilt and our shame. I needed hope, and he just kept dunking me back under water. Well, the purpose is that you would come up and behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ like never before, and, and that is what has happened. I have a few, uh, lots of memories, actually, of just that journey, but one that stood out, I don't even know if he's here this morning, but one Sunday, Kyle and Haley Gallup came walking in. He, he looks like the Incredible Hulk. Oh, there he is. Did you stand for this? Pays to come late, brother. I'm glad you're here. Don't leave yet. So just get a look. Take your jacket off and let them see the tats and the muscles. I just, I will never forget that first Sunday when you came and there's only 50 people in here and all our masks were on. And then he, I just thought, oh, he's going to hate this. 
And he comes up afterwards, all smiles. I could see his eyes through his mask lifting up. And he said, we just want a church that labors in the word of God. And that, that they're late, but they've never left the church since. <laughs> and then I just began watching that happen weekly. And what happened as we looked at this gospel together really is nothing short of what I was praying for. And the number of people who have been revived in the gospel in this body, who, who have received it for the first time, is just nothing short of an act of God. I feel like the church in Acts, they're praying for Peter's release. And Peter knocks on the door and they're like, it must be a spirit. <laughs> it must be an angel. You know, it can't be Peter. We're praying, release him, Lord. And he's knocking at the door. And I just felt like I'm praying for revival. And he's doing it right in my midst. And I shouldn't be amazed. This is beautiful. And with it, I've never seen the enemy come upon this congregation more to try to break the unity of the spirit. Uh, since I've been a pastor. It, it has been intense. It has been a deep battle. But on the other hand, with what is happening, with those who are holding themselves in there, it's just people are being transformed in numerous ways, and I've been overwhelmed with the beauty of what God's doing in our midst. So God has done more than I could have asked or hoped. And as we began this letter in my own heart, I truly just feel like a new man stands before you than when I started two years ago. Laboring in this letter, God has take, taken it deeper into my heart than ever before, and I just feel thanks and praise. They're overflowing, and I, I see it in all your hearts. Amen? So what I want to do this morning is, is we've been going through looking at the trees for the last two years of Romans, and I just want to close out Romans 1 through 8 this morning by doing a flyover of the forest, and then we're going to go to the table exulting in the grace of God. And so if you'll flip back to Romans chapter 1 and pray for self-control because I just spent two years studying, meditating, praying, and, and now i got to survey it in 45 minutes and it just I'm betting against it. I'm just <laughs> nervous. Let's begin because these introduction verses are jumping out of my heart like never before coming back. Paul a bondservant of Christ, that's what this gospel does to a heart, a willing bond slave. Here's my life, Lord, I'm your servant. When you understand this gospel, response, do loss. Here's my life, God, I'm, I'll serve you the rest of my days. Called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This is God's gospel that we've been looking at for two years. It's not my thoughts, it's God's. And he promised it beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. This is, he's been saying it for thousands of years, picturing, telling us. We get to see it in typological ways. And so here it is. This isn't a new gospel. God has promised it since creation. And what is the gospel? Concerning his son. It's the, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this son was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. This deity, the second person of the Trinity, was born into this world. He came and he took on flesh, fully God, fully man, promised a seed of David would come into the world. This was the one. But he was also declared, Harizo, marked off as the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, fully God and fully man, and he died and he was raised and he's seated at the right hand of God this morning. Through whom then we have received grace and apostleship. What for, Paul? To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. And so I'm writing this letter, Paul says, is I, I, wanna, I wanna bring about the obedience of faith. I wanna see you come to to believe this. And so there, there's kind of this construction there that it could mean two things. It could be, I'm writing this so that you'll believe the gospel, or I'm writing this uh, so you'll obey the gospel. And, and to me, what we've seen in Romans is they're inseparable. So I'm writing that you won't just hear about this gospel, you'll believe it. You'll look at it and you'll entrust your life to this gospel. You'll believe it, and then after that, is, there's an outworking of that faith. How are, how are we to live in light of these truths? What should we do? It's not just your head understanding doctrines, 
but your hands and your feet and your mouths going out now and serving. Bodies that are being offered up as living sacrifices to God. To no longer give your members to serve sin, to be the devil's errand boy, but now to give your members as those alive from the dead to serve God. That's what the obedience of faith brings. I see the gospel, I'm obeying by believing the command, believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. And the one who believes and lives in faith, you're going to have a, a life that begins to be changed and live in light of these truths and realities that we have been studying. The path to that kind of life matters to Paul to spend eight chapters. And he says it's not by law. Just working hard at living the Christian life will never get you there. This phrase that's overtaking me in Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. The ones who have been saved, who are declared not guilty, they're the ones who are now going to live by faith. And this is strange to say, but I meet more and more people professing Jesus Christ who live for the scene. You live your life by what you can perceive and understand and, and, and your eyes are looking at. You, you, won't, you won't live by faith that you're loved by God and you have eternity and you're right with him. You won't, you won't live that way. And he's saying you need to have the obedience of faith and the just ones are going to live in a whole new way. I can see Jesus Christ see at the right hand of God and that is going to change the way I live my life. I can't keep acting like this world is everything. And so if you're going to be a Christian, they live by faith in this gospel. And I don't interpret my life by my feelings and what I can understand. I interpret it now in light of this word and who God is. The just ones are going to live by faith. That's what sets us apart from this world. We don't live for this world. We live for the one to come. We have our eyes opened and I live now into the unseen God. That's what's happened in my life. Paul then is overflowing about this gospel. And in verse 14, he says, I'm a debtor to all men. And this is what I want everyone to get. When you get saved, you now are a debtor to every unbeliever. He says to the Jew first in verse 16, to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the couth, the uncouth, the civilized, the uncivilized, all of humanity. I'm now a debtor to tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I owe it. It's, this message must be known. There are not many ways back to God. There's only one way in this message. And I owe it to every human being to tell them the way of escape from God's wrath back to God in peace and love. I'm a debtor. And I walk around this world and I, I, I feel that debt. And I just want to tell everyone and anyone about this good news of the gospel because it's overwhelming. With these eight chapters, they're true. And I just got to tell and proclaim this message. And so in verse 15, Paul says, I'm eager to come preach it to you who are in Rome. Don't you feel that way? I pray you got something of that in your heart. I'm eager to tell you, anyone. You, you don't ask me questions like, how you doing today? Or you're going to, I'm, I'm eager. And I want to tell you about the gospel. That's what this gospel starts doing in a heart. Become eager. Why? In verse 16, the, the 16 through 17, the theme of the whole epistle because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's God's power to bring humanity, we said, in the, to that circle of salvation. There's no other way to get into this realm of being saved and being right with God. No other way. There's only one power, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm not ashamed of it, because there's only one way in here, and so I'm not going to let you live thinking there's other ways. I'm not ashamed to tell you, and I will be shamed by this world to tell them, here's the way in to this gospel salvation. Well, how does this gospel save? Well, in it, we said it's a subjective genitive. The, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. A God kind of righteousness is revealed in this gospel. And Paul now takes eight chapters to answer what does that mean? A God kind of righteousness is revealed in this gospel. So where does Paul begin with the gospel? And I want you to make sure you hear this. He begins with the really bad news. Okay, it's not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It's you're in a really bad condition. And that's where we begin with some really bad news. 
You need to get it so that you can be saved. What, what, what do you need to be saved from is the question. And I just think that's forgotten in our day. We think we're being saved from a bad life. You are being saved from God. Jesus sent his son into the world to save you from himself, from his wrath and his condemnation that was rightfully on us. Jesus came to save us from God the Father. And he begins now the gospel in 118 through 320. And he begins in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And so there's a power in this world called sin. When Adam sinned, it spread to all men and death spread to all men. Romans 3, 9, he says, we're all Jew and Gentile are under the dominion of sin. It rules, it reigns, it controls you, it brings you under condemnation. That, that is the power ruining this whole world and our own lives is sin. And it's so powerful that you can look at this amazing creation and it tells you of the invisible attributes of God and his divine power. And you look at it and you suppress it and say, I'd rather worship creatures. I'd rather worship me. I'd rather worship a singer or a movie star instead of God. And, and that's the depravity and the power of sin that just proves there's a God every time I look out there and we look at that and say, aren't I great? Wish everybody would make much of me. That's the definition of sin and depravity that you could look at such a thing and suppress God and say, I, I just want my unrighteousness. I want to live my own way. And then the other way, he said, is you can take the beauty of God's law and take it and just use it to correct other people, to preach it and be the correctors of the foolish and tell people don't steal while you're a thief in your heart and not preach it to yourself. And that's all of chapter two. Just be religious Pharisees that spend all your time condemning and telling how bad the world is and, and just looking out there, it's never been worse. Why, why the worst person is right here inside my own heart. That's depravity. The pure holy law. And you use it as a ladder to try to climb to heaven. Romans 3, 19 through 20. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. And that what for? So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Sin opens mouths. Sin makes you think that you can come up with your own way to God, that you're not so bad. And in, in the law was given to shut your mouth. Before God, you have no argument, you're guilty. And then in verse 20, by the works of the law, trying to do good works and climb the ladder to God, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So we said it's just a mirror that shows you who you are before God, not the place to wash and cleanse your face. It just shows you you're guilty. That's why the law was given. And therefore, all, in verse 23, um, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And here's the definition of sin. God is glorious, and this is all about him. And we suppress him by our sin with whether it's the law or whether by creation, religion, whatever it is, we will suppress God and not give him the value and the glory and the honor that he deserves. So guys, we need a gospel. This gospel cannot be, what can I do to get out from under this condemnation and this righteous judgment that's upon me? And that's world religions. Every one of them are teaching you there's something you can do to get out from the predicament I just laid out. And Paul said, there's none righteous no, not even one. You're 10,000 leagues under the sea. What you do not need is a life vest. You need the hand of God to reach in and pull you out and save you. And so I ask you, sitting before God this morning, have you come to see this about yourself? Have you truly come to see it? Are you still a good guy? Or have you been wrecked by your selfish, sinful, God-hating heart? Have you seen it? Your problem this morning is not that you need more religion, not that you need to work harder. It's not that you need some relationship or a retirement plan or health acceptance from others, the right job, the right circumstances. That is not your problem. Your problem is you need to be saved from sin and the condemnation that you sit under this morning by the creator of the universe 
who you will stand in judgment one day who knows the secrets of your heart. And so we, Paul wants us to feel naked and ashamed. And he says, you, you need to. You need to be desperate and you need to be without hope so that you would love the remedy that God has given to bring about out of this predicament that's so dark and dangerous. And so what are my favorite two words in Romans? Some of you remember. Verse 21. Thank you. To put it up on your refrigerators, don't ever forget these two words. They're my two favorite words because that, that is a dark, dark message. It's a message of condemnation. It's no message that should be preached during COVID. And when you're sitting under it, I need to hear the words, but now, but now God has done something. He didn't leave us in that condition. There's, a, there, there's the, God acted in his creation. He's done something to remedy this problem. So I tell you that bad news, not so you'll wallow and die, but now I can tell you, but now, feel it, sense it, know it, so that but now you can hear what God has done. And look in verse 21. But now, apart from the law that was given through Moses, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Back to Romans 1.17. What is that righteousness? A God kind of righteousness has been manifested apart from law. And it's been witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's been telling us and predicting it and prophesying it through all the Old Testament. And it's the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there's no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> there's another way to receive a God kind of righteousness that he requires to be at his presence than law. And it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God, and he says it's by faith and not by your works. The best message you could ever hear. It's God has done it all. And it's a gift. And it's by his son's works of what he'll now uh, lay out in Romans. So Paul brings us to the doctrine now of justification by faith in Christ alone. There's a way for God to declare you not guilty, acceptable, and bring you back into his presence. And it's by the work of Christ and by faith alone in what Christ has done. Look with me in verse 24 of chapter 3. Therefore, being justified not guilty, as a gift by his grace. And I just don't ever let those words get away from you. This is such a gift. And, and the, 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 what's inside this wrapping paper is grace. And, and inside the salvation, it's all of what Jesus did. It was all his goodness, his freeness of what he did to save us. The salvation is nothing short of the grace of God through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And so the way to be right is through Jesus who came and paid the ransom price to set us free from the bondage of sin and the law. And then if you'll look with me in verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. And so propitiation means to appease the wrath of God. So Romans 1 through 3, the wrath of God is on you. It has to come off. And law can't get it off. Being a good person and good resolve can't remove it. So God puts his son up on a cross and he propitiates the full wrath of God for all of our sin. Every last drop on that cross, he drains it. Remember the cup, there wasn't even a drop left. So the cross is the answer to get the wrath of God off you. My only hope is Jesus hanging in my place, bearing God's wrath for my sin. There's no other wrath remover. Uh, apart from that, you will bear under that wrath for all of eternity. That's the only way to get it off. It's to look to Jesus Christ as your wrath remover, the propitiation. And he said this was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. And, and so <clears throat> he looks... And, and how can God forgive those old David, King David, and the Old Testament saints? How do you just look, if you're, if you're a just, righteous God, how do you just ignore all that? How does he ignore your sin this morning? How does he, how does he do that? And the answer is he's a just God. So th there's got to be a way for him to punish sin and then to forgive it and still be just. And the answer is Jesus Christ, God punishing him with his sword of justice piercing him through for our sin. And now he can forgive you and not violate any of his character. This, this was big. 
He had to demonstrate it. He had to show, I'm a righteous God. If I just forgive you, I'm unrighteous. But if I punish my own son, my own son, I'm just when I forgive you. And I'm the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Verse 28, then, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed, the God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. That no one has a disadvantage now because it's by faith. And anyone, Jew or Gentile, who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. This is a message for the nations. I sat with a missionary couple yesterday, looking at the cost to take this message across the world. And guys, you might read these little books about missionaries and think being a missionary is sexy or easy. (laughs) The cost is unbelievable. And it costs you sometimes your family, your jobs, your security, your very own life. You, You must die. And streams coming down this man's face at the cost and saying, I'll I'll go preach this message to the lost in a closed country. And then we can be embarrassed to speak to a waiter or to drive across the city to share with a teenager. There's a cost to this gospel. I pray you're seeing it. And so the question then, is this seems kind of like a weird deal. In the Old Testament, you got Moses and the law, and it was such a focus. And now Paul's coming and saying, no, the, the, the gospel of God is justification by faith alone. Like, the, it just seems like the whole Testament just got thrown out. And that's our chapter four, if you look at me in verse one. What then shall we say, Abraham, the father of faith, the father of the Jews? Here, here he is. What should we say about him? According to the flesh has found. If Abraham was justified by his works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what, is it, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He had, he had faith. He believed what God said he was going to do. He's going to bless the nations through a singular seed. And Abraham believes it. He had, he had faith in this gospel, not flushed out like we have it, but faith. And that faith, he says, you're justified. You are right with me. This is the way I've always done it. I brought the law in just to, to lead you to Christ, to show you who you are so you would believe this gospel. So it's always been by grace through faith. It's not a new message. Don't, don't think he changed plans. And it just, it does not seem strange would be the argument. This idea of, of imputation, the idea of Jesus's works being put to my account, Paul. I've never heard that before. And the rest of Romans 5, he says, you know what? <laughs> the first Adam was a representative head. And when he sinned, he plunged all of humanity with us. And, and it's easy for you this morning to say, I've got the effects of Adam. I have sin. I don't, it's not hard for me to believe that I inherited a sin nature from Adam. That's probably the easiest thing I've ever believed in my life. I live it. I see it. And so there it is. When Adam sinned, he, took, he represented all of us. And his guilt and the effects of that have passed on to all. And Paul says, and then the second Adam came and he won the victory. And he obeyed perfect righteousness, dying on a cross. And he now is our representative head. And God can now treat us based on what he did instead of based on what I did. And so this isn't a new message. This has been the message of the whole Bible Paul is showing them. God can treat you as if you did what Christ did. <clears throat> and if you are tied to his coattails by faith, we were tied to Adam um, by birth, and we're tied to Christ by the new birth. And that we looked at that beautiful Greek word, logizomai, and we saw that it's It's the credit to the account. So God takes all of your sins, past, present, and future, and he credits them to Christ's account and puts them on a cross. And and God's justice is poured out on his own son. And now he takes the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. I I can meditate on this every day. The perfect righteousness of Christ, and he logizomize it to my account 
so that now God does look at me as if I live the life that Jesus lived and that he died for the sins that I lived. That's the gospel. Oh, get so my. For all who will believe, there's a way to be made right with God through this gospel. That's just so beautiful, isn't it? End of letter. Go home. Pizza ready, Murph? Okay. I pray that it comes on time. Paul now is going to take on some abuses of this gospel. And I've told you before, Lloyd-Jones says, if you preach what I just preach faithfully, you're going to be accused of, man, you're, this is too free. Why don't I just sin that grace might abound? And that's Romans 6.1. Man, it's such a free gospel. Let's just go sin. And Paul's going to say, how can you who died to sin still live in it? Don't you know at your baptism, what you were in Adam died and what has been raised is, is a whole new creation. Your sin nature is no longer has dominion over you. Uh, you've been set free in Christ. Don't you know that? How can you still live in sin with, with, with the realities of what happened where I just want to keep sinning then that grace might abound? Just, he says, perish the thought. Make in a toy. It's no way. Believers can't think this way. And then Romans 6, 15. Let's find it. What then shall we sin? Because we're not under law, but under grace. May it never be. So we come out from under law. Now we're under grace, God's favor, and God's acceptance. Should I just sin? I just, there's no more condemnation. The law can't condemn me. Let's just sin. And Paul answers it really powerfully. My favorite verse, I think, in Romans, second favorite, verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you as a believer. Sin is not going to dominate you like it did when you were an unbeliever. Why? You're not under law, but you're under grace. There's a whole new way for believers to live. And so sin isn't going to control you any longer because you're under grace. So how do you say, I'm under grace, let me just sin that grace might abound? You don't get it. So uh, there's a power now for the believer that you are now, you have a new ruler called grace, Jesus Christ. And that grace is going to transform and change and make you more holy than the law ever could. There's a new power. There's a new sheriff in town. Not the Diabolos, Jesus Christ. Do you get what has happened in the gospel? Sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under law, but under grace. Look at Romans 7, 4. This is my favorite verse. <coughs> Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law. And this is the scariest thing to a lot of people. If you die to the law, aren't you going to go live lawless? And Paul's saying, you died to the law of Moses. How? To the body of Christ for a purpose so that you could be joined to another, that you could be married to Jesus Christ by faith. And when you're married to Jesus, to him who was raised from the dead, so that we might bear fruit for God. And so I've died to trying to perform and live that law out and get favor with God through that law. It's, it's been fulfilled. And now I'm married to Jesus Christ. And in this relationship, fruit is going to come from abiding in the vine. So the, the new covenant is a whole new way to get fruit for God, and it's not by law. It's by relationship with Jesus Christ. This gospel brings you into a real vital union with the Savior. I am his and he is mine. And in Romans 7, 5, while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law we're at work in our members to bear the fruit of death. But now, love those words. But now, we've been released from the law. I, I, I joke, why didn't Paul just say we weren't under the law? <laughs> You've died to it. We've been released from the law, having died to that by which you were bound, so that now we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. It's the rest of the, the, the epistle is that there's a way now to get holy by being joined and having the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit will lead us now into Christ's likeness. So I have something better than law in my own strength trying to keep it. I have Jesus Christ who kept it, made me acceptable. God loves me, puts his Holy Spirit in me now to lead me and conform me and change me into the image of Christ. I have the power of God dwelling in me. 
Romans chapter 8. The whole chapter is about the Holy Spirit now taking believers and changing and transforming us from one image of glory to the next. So how do we grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ is the question. How do we live holy lives to our God? That's the first pant of a newborn baby is holiness. And the answer is stunning. If you want to grow and get sanctified, you have to die to the law. The opposite of what we hear everywhere. Law is not how we get holy. Rather, it's now by the new life and the Holy Spirit and the just shall live by faith. And something really powerful called grace is now the reigning principle of our life. And by the Spirit, a way greater power than moral resolve and law is that by believing this gospel, I'm no longer under condemnation. I'm married to Christ. Last Sunday, nothing can separate me from this love. This marriage cannot end except in consummation at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And now in believing that, I know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I now know that this God is working every detail of my life to shape and conform me to Christ. And I know that he foreknew me, he predestined me, he called me, he justified me, and he's going to glorify me. I know that, that uh, uh, let's see, who, who, if God is for us, who could be against us? Uh, if God didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he also not freely give him all things? Who can bring a charge against his elect? He's the one who justifies. All that we've been looking at in Romans 8 now is I, I live into these. I, I believe them. The just shall live by faith. And I don't walk around just God's against me. He's mad at me. If I do one thing wrong, I'm going to be condemned. I need my own strength to change myself. That isn't, it, I, I live by faith now. And these promises and what I'm watching in this church those who are laying hold of this, just holiness is springing up. Christ-likeness is, you, you're just like, what's going on here? It's, or, it's organic. It's supernatural. God is growing the fruits of the Spirit in your life because you're starting to really believe, not under law. So much of church uh, makes, tries to use law to make you feel guilty, to make you live holy. And I'm telling you, feel no guilt. You're justified. Believe this gospel. And in that, transformation begins to flow. And I'm not living in fear. I'm not afraid. All the freedom that will come. And so I want you to hear this. The key is not the law, but who I've been married to. He loves me. And the Spirit is leading me into deeper communion with Christ. And that is where the metamorphosis takes place, by beholding Him, by abiding in Him. It's Christ. Like I, I, this, we can't make enough about Christ. Christ, Christ. There's just something about that name. He's everything. And I'm watching you get it. And it's changing you from one in, image of glory to the next. It's growing you. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, not by law, but by grace. We get all of him. And this is what takes over a heart to finally be able to lose your lives for others and to love God. Because of Romans 7, we'll always be imperfect because of sin. We're going to always be battling this, but I want you to hear this. It can be true, your love, and it can be genuine, and it can be sincere, though full of defects and battles and struggles and jealousies and envies and these things that must be mortified by the Spirit, by living into these promises, walking in the Spirit, confessing sin, being restored. This communion is the power to be changed. It's never going to be your power. It will always be in the, in the vine is, is where we got to stay, which makes sin all the more grievous when it's against the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And so let the gospel of grace break in and godly living will break out. So one day, or you can walk into a room and instead of worrying about yourself and thinking all about yourself, you can love every person in that room. That's called freedom. Instead of walking in and trying to see how I can get loved, I can come in and love. Do not spend all your time thinking about you and worrying about you and your needs because God has them. It frees you to meet other people's needs. 
to taste such extravagant love, you just want to put it on others. When others wrong me, I can handle it because God's dealt with me in grace. When others bring a charge, I can stand and say, who can bring a charge against God's elect? To labor, not to be loved by God, but because I am, unconditionally and forever, is freeing and life-changing. To believe that God is not out to get you, but that your circumstances uh, are Him working all things together for good. I just want you to see this is the power of, of transformation. Believe the gospel. And it gets at the root of all your sins and what you're battling. And this will produce righteousness. The just shall live by faith. To live in freedom. The freedom that is being offered to you in this gospel is to live and to die in Christ. And so I tell you, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the fountain of all holiness. And the law can never bring this to pass. Only grace. Grace. And so I'm asking you to enter into the life of grace by faith. Has this season brought about the obedience of faith in you? Do you still sit in the church and know all the doctrines, but you don't believe? You haven't given yourself to these truths, and you just you don't trust them. And you don't have the, the change in life and the conformity that you're longing for because you won't entrust yourself to him. And so that, that's what he's saying, entrust yourself to me. Believe. Receive the freeness and the fullness of this gospel. And this is obedience to believe it and now go live the life of living into the fullness of all of this stuff. You're going to love like no other people if you will believe this gospel. So maybe after... Two years of me begging this morning might be the time that you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and the staggering gospel of God. I, I invite any one of you who have never surrendered your lives to this Christ. There's a way to be right with God. And I'm eager to preach it. I'm not ashamed of it. This is your hope. This is your help. Please, if, if you've never believed in Christ, surrendered this to him, may this be the morning. Don't let 30 years of being in a denomination keep you from Christ. Don't, don't let having the Heidelberg Catechism memorized keep you from Jesus Christ. He offers it freely. And the, in fact, I skipped something I wanted to mention. I'm going back. Romans 4, 4, now to the one who works, it's a participle to a working one to get right with God. His wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who is not a working one, I'm not trying to work to get God's favor but believes in him who justifies what? The ungodly. That's my only hope. He doesn't justify the godly. He justifies the ungodly. That's the only thing I've ever been able to do my whole life. I'm an expert at it. Ungodly. I, I just want you to hope that it isn't the good people. The one who will believe this message, God will justify the ungodly. To the one who won't work. You're not a working one. You're not going to keep trying to work to get his favor. But you believe this message. God justifies you sitting here in this place this morning, not guilty, accepted. And isn't that beautiful? We'll do anything except nothing to have this. Now our call, individually and corporately, is to fight the fight of faith, to live into this gospel and to believe it, to not be moved away from it, to not let our love for Christ cool and to, to let the fruit of being loved like this and so securely turn us into a city set on a hill to shine the beauty of Christ and make the world want our Savior. To God be the glory for Romans 1 through 8. I can't get over this message. I mean, I was, I was just reading it this week in one sitting. Romans 1 through 8 is unbelievable. It's eternity past to eternity future. I mean, it's, it's all eight chapters, all of the world, the history. Believe the unbelievable. It's so beautiful. So let's go to the table and remember the greatest act of love on our behalf, the cross of Christ, on which the Prince of Glory died for us. Let's pray. Father, I love this gospel. I 
pray that everyone in this room sees the glory and the beauty. It's never going to come by being a working one. It will never be by works. Paul could not have said it. And he, he just said it again and again. Not by works, not by works, but by faith, but by faith, believing the work of Jesus. Lord, let all be done this morning with working to find your favor. Let it end. That burden and that weight, Lord, let it fall off shoulders this morning. And let every eye stare at Jesus Christ and believe in the one who hung on the cross in our place and lived the life that we never could. And because of Logitzomai, we can have his record put to our account. Oh God, this gospel's big and large and beautiful and glorious, and yet it's simple enough for the little two-year-olds to come to Jesus this morning. God, we thank you for it. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.